Well, you know, uh, let me say, first of all, I know it's very hard now because we're near lunch and uh, you've been there a long time, and it won't offend me in the least. I can't see you anyway, so uh, it won't offend me in the least if you get up and leave. Um, I told Graham when he invited me that I'd, this is not a topic about which I know anything, and uh, now I'm even more convinced. Uh, first of all, I, I didn't, a lot of the talks this morning have had very inspiring quotes, and this is the quote I brought, which is, ac which is really academic gobbledygook, uh, but unfortunately it's crucially important. Uh, this is uh, a kind of summary of what uh, cognitive science, the learning sciences have discovered about the human brain. And unfortunately, they write it this way, but I'm going to try to explicate for you why this quote is actually very important, because it's at the, it's at the very heart of why schools are such miserable failures. All right, what this says is that comprehension, by which he means understanding either a book or the world, it doesn't matter, understanding anything for human beings, this may not be true of Martians, but it's true of human beings, is grounded in your being able to simulate in your head out of your experiences, stuff that prepare you for action, right? It says that if you're going to understand a book, you draw on experiences you've actually had to simulate in your head those experiences, to get ready to think, to hypothesize for an action you want to take. Now, the way I think about this is what it's really claiming is that we run video games in our heads to think. Because think about it, what, what you do in a video game is you have a world of experience, but you're an actor in it. You know, you move around, you're in there. And what this says is that's really how you understand the world, that you can run in your head, if you've had any experiences, stories and scenarios uh, that get you ready for action. Now, the, the other side of this quote says that if you, don't, if you don't have experiences in an area, or you're not doing something where you're going to prepare for an action, you will be at your worst. Now think about, think about what this means uh, when we get to books. What it says is you don't understand a book unless you've had the experiences about, you know, related to the content of that book. So if it's a book in science, then you don't understand the book unless you've had embodied experiences relevant to science. And those experiences are things you can think through and simulate in your head when you, and when you have a goal for action. So what do we do with books? We give them to kids in school who've had no experience in that domain when they're not going to be ready for any action. We, we use them in exactly the way where we predict they would, be, they would be bad off. Now let me put this in another way. This is exactly like, which I discovered when I started playing video games, this is exactly like giving people game, the manuals for games without the games. See, if you're a gamer, you know this. A Manual for a game, you know, this is why kids don't do this, but adults do it. You start playing video games, and what do you do? You get the manual out and you start to read it, right? It's the absolute stupidest thing you could do. Because why? The manual makes absolutely no sense if you haven't seen the images and the actions and had the experiences of the game, right? So it's just boring and it make, makes no sense. But then a weird thing happens if you read the manual after you played the game. Everything in the manual makes perfect sense now. Why? Because it has what I call situated meanings. That is, every word in the manual is now connected to an image, to an experience, to an action, to a piece of dialogue. Situated meanings. That is, you can run experiences in your head, you can think through those experiences because you just saw them in the game. So, we would, school is as successful as you would expect it to be if you were to have a game camp and give the kids only manuals. Except that you'd probably get a revolution if you did that and not give them uh, the game. Well, let me give you a concrete example. This is typical academic language. This is the sort of thing you see in school. Uh, you see it by high school, the age in America where many, many, many kids drop out. And uh, that is, ap not only is that incredibly boring stuff, it's totally meaningless unless you can put into your head experiences from geology and experiences that are keyed to action. Now, if you, if you can't, I ask, and many of us can't, I can't, for example, I ask you, do you want to take that with you for summer reading? Is that, do you want to read that before you go to sleep at night? See, so the thing is, though, that if you have, the theory that I started out was, if you do have experiences to marry to that, and you do put it in a situation of action, it turns out it isn't the least bit hard. It's, we're playing a type of game with people when we give them the, this is the manual for geology, but we don't give people the game.
Now, of course, one, one of the morals, is we have technologies now, it's one of the things I'm going to argue, that both the handheld technologies, but all of the platforms, the digital technology, in which we can give the people the games and the experiences, if we don't want to keep playing the traditional game of schooling. All right. Now, I want to, in order to say, I, I want to argue uh, as fast as I can, given that you're near lunch, that, um, that video, there is a, you know, we can talk about how schools are failing. But there's now in the 21st century another curriculum, a competing curriculum out of school. And kids in this curriculum are doing complex things and accomplishing complex goals and using complex language like that geology language all the time. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. And that curriculum is actually based on very deep principles of learning, just the ones we've discovered in learning sciences and cognitive science. So that we have a paradox today. Our schools don't use the best principles we know about learning, but our popular culture does. Now, I want to run over a few ways in which video games really deal with this problem of language. See, so you've said in school already, we give people the manual without the game. The words are not married to experience. They're not married to the world. They're decontextualized in the world, and therefore, most people don't get it. All right, now, here, what, here's one thing that all video games do this. Let's take an example, Metal Gear Solid. Any video game does this. It's a rule system. It's a complex system that actually does a very interesting cognitive thing to be a gamer. And that is, in these systems, you, you, you are co constantly switching between two different perspectives. One, an inside perspective where you're in the rule system and you're actually inside of it, and you have to figure out from a place inside of it, how does this system work to my advantage? How can I get these actions and accomplish with my advantage? The other perspective is top-down. You're looking at the whole system from the top-down and figuring out what, as you, what is the role system, what is it like, right? You're constantly switching between in, being in it and being out of it. Now, this turns out to be a cognitively very complex thing to do, uh, uh, but very good for your head. Now, here's, and, and it's already being done in areas that we might consider more academic. So, take a game like Civilization. And Civilization forces you to think about hundreds of variables to do with building your civilization for thousands of years while constantly thinking from one place in it. What does the world look like when I stand here in this very specific situation? And then being able to flip and look at the whole thing top down and think about what's the whole system. And then how can I use that for my position to, to good effect? And then how can I go back? How can I keep switching uh, between these two things? What this does, what, what's the stance here, is gamers gain what I call an empathy for a system or an empathy for a complex system. They're inside of it and outside of it simultaneously so that they get a, a very cognitively complex uh, empathy for how systems work. Now, it turns out this, it, this is a characteristic way in which scientists think. See, scientists build simulations that are a lot like games, but there's a big difference. The gamer is both in it and out of it. I already said, you're, you're a character in the game, or you're running a town in the game, plus you're looking at it as a whole system. The scientist, just, if he's building a uh, you know, model of an electromagnetic field, he's not an electron in the system. It, in a game, you would be. See, that's the game you want to make. If you're making this a game, you're the electron and you're, you're looking at the whole system. However, it turns out that scientists who know what they're talking about think like they were the electron. So here's the scientist. He's looking at one of his diagrams and he says, when I come down, I'm in the domain state. He thinks he's in it. See, that's a gamer attitude. He's going to be in it and look at it from perspective and then he's going to stand out and look at the whole system. A very cognitively complex thing to do. The second thing that games do, if I've already talked about, you know, there's two ways to understand words. One is purely verbal. I give you a bunch of words, you don't know what they mean, so I give you a lot more words. That's what we do in school. You don't get this text, here's another text. You don't know what this word means, what I'm going to give you, a definition, a bunch of other words. That's a verbal understanding, uh, which tends to be fairly worthless. Situated understandings which are married to your experience in the world, are when you can associate a word with an image, an action, dialogue, or experiences you had. Now, and th and that, think of the geology text. If you, if you don't understand it, what I'm going to offer you in a verbal way, in a school way, is just give you more text, more geology. I'll just explain every word with a lot more words, and you'll be bored. And you won't understand it anyway, and you won't retain it for three minutes. 
On the other hand, I could start giving you all the images, actions, and experiences those words stand for, immerse you in those, and then that language would become simple. And I'll prove that to you in a minute. So situated meanings means that I've married words to the world. Now see, this is what games can that hold the greatest promise for, because we can create worlds. All the worlds we want to teach, whether it's physics, biology, chemistry, civics, we can create worlds and marry the words to those worlds. It's, uh, you know, to give you an example of how this works in gaming now, and we can do this a lot better. How many people, see I can't see you, but uh, has anybody played Portal? Boy, there's a real problem here. Uh, uh, Portal is a fabulous game, uh, you know, uh, uh, and what you do in Portal is you don't get to kill anything. Uh, you, ha you can make you could make two portals with the portal gun, a blue one and an orange one, and then you go in one, you come out the other. And, and then with that alone, you have to get out of all, the, it's, it's by the way made by some graduate students, uh, and then it got bought as a commercial gain. It's actually a critique of graduate school. So you're in a lab and a robotic voice is telling you you're an idiot, they're gonna test you, you'll never get out of this room, you're gonna have to use the portal thing to get out of the room which has a lot of hazards. And the, the robot is uh, ridiculing you the whole time. And then when you get out of the room, the robot says, well, I, you know, I didn't think you were that smart, but you know, the next room will be bad, you're really stupid. And then by the end, the you find out the robot's trying to kill you and you have to escape from the thing. That was their view of graduate school. Now, in this, um, but it made them a lot of money. Now, in this uh, game, is actually playing with the principle of physics. And so uh, there's a whole bunch of physical principles that you actually embody. One, for example, the law of conservation of momentum. If you, if you could in this game, you have to sometimes, uh, you'd have to be able to fling yourself clear across this room to get to a balcony. And the way you do that is I'd make a portal right here on the stage, and then I'd make a portal back there. Trouble is, I've got to be going, I've, the momentum's going to be conserved, so I've got to get enough momentum here to come out of there with just the right momentum to go across the, the room. And so as you do that 112 times, the law of conservation momentum is now in your body because you're actually flinging through the room and you have to calculate and you have to think about it and when you fail, you plop on the floor and you get the whole thing. However, so you're living out these physical laws, you're embodying them, you're be, they're situated. Now you've got images, really embodied images. Now, typical of gamer culture, not, this is a commercial game, so nobody's trying to teach you the physics in the sense of lecturing to you in the game. However, you know, gamers are geeks and nerds, and so they can't stop themselves once they get a passion for this stuff and discover this physicsness from getting on it, going onto an internet site and then just geeking out over physics. So here's one of them geeking out of physics. This guy's actually put up some of the physics and the actual language of it with links to what it means, right? Now think about it. What we're trying to do in education is to get somebody to understand this sort of gobbledygook language. But this is already married in this game. This language is married to that world you've been flinging yourself through. We could do it better by putting that language into the game in ways in which the person immediately saw at times how the pieces of language translated exactly to what you were doing in action and embodiment. And then we would get situated understandings, right? But the gamer culture has already, already at least got this piece of language married to this piece of embodiment. Uh, you know, by the way, I didn't bring it. it, I wished I had. There's a little piece of advertising for this game that is a brilliant theory of education. It says, what we, we do in this game is we give you a new tool that will let you surmise new possibilities in your environment. You see, because with this tool, all of a sudden, you surmise all the possibilities of this environment here for physics. You realize with this tool, I can do a whole bunch of stuff and I look at the environment in an entirely new way. Now, wouldn't that be great in education that we saw it? You want to learn civics, you want to learn physics, you want to learn social studies. I got a tool here that will make you see the world in a new way, a completely new way, and that way is civics, or that way is social studies, or that way is physics embodied in that tool. All right, the other thing is, remember I said that language to human beings is pretty damn meaningless unless it is both situated, that is tied to their experience, tied to image, action, dialogue, but also we are best when we have a goal and when we're gonna prepare for action. 
right? By the way, there's even evidence in neuroscience of this, that if you process stuff through your amygdala, through the part of your brain that puts an emotional charge on stuff, where you care about it or something's at stake, you process it much more deeply, you integrate it much more with your other information, and if nothing's at stake, you process it superficially. Now, in school, we know, for most kids, nothing but failure, you know, getting sorted at the bottom of the other kids is at stake. Certainly, when you go tell them we're going to do algebra, what's at stake? Nobody tells them. So we know, then, that they're going to process it in a very superficial way. All right, so one thing, though, that games do is they realize if you're going to give people a lot of really technical language, and, you know, like algebra or civics, you, it's best to do it in a way that it leads them directly to action and lets them use that language to do something. Now, any World of Warcraft players here? Wow. This is a digital media company. This is the most played game in the world. Maybe, you, yeah, I don't know. I didn't know, by the way, until I came today that England is broken. I found that really interesting. But I think you could unbreak it if you play more of these games. Um, <laughs> God, that's going to make no sense. Uh, well, World of Warcraft is an action game. 15 million people play it. Um, and, uh, and what the community has done, which is very typical, is as you get to be really expert in this game, the community makes what are called mods. And what the mod is, is little, you've seen all that language on the screen, which by the way has eaten up the screen, you can't see the game anymore, is mods people have made to let the players theorize and think while they're playing. So I'll give you one example, the damage meter. If you're playing this game, you go in with other people, you play it together, and all of you have a different, each person going in has a different skill set, you're a different type of character. Everybody's got to do their job perfectly and integrate it with each other. And there's always the free rider problem. You know, somebody can go in and you're not doing your job, you're a crummy priest, you don't heal anybody. So these damage meters go up, and it actually analyzes all the way everybody's playing in a statistic and shows for each character, relative to what they should be doing, how good they are at doing it at that moment, so that you can yell at the guy, you're a free rider, you're doing no good, or, you know, get your, get your act together. And Every one of, so th what it is, it's a whole theory of how characters ought to play the game, what the damage is, and how it relates. It's a statistical theory. And then, by the way, they get, uh, there's mo millions of different damage mods. The kids get together and argue whose theory of statistics is better. Right? They don't do that in school, but they do it here. Well, look at this. Every piece of that language, the kid is playing the game while reading that language, using it so that they can in, uh, uh, theorize their play and make it better. Right? The, this is language that is actually prepared for action. And yet, by the way, you can't see it. All of that is incredibly technical stuff. But see, and you can't do it in the beginning. And by, what's great about this is all the mods get to be so many, and people slap them on the screen so everybody can share them and theorize together while they're playing. When you get to be really expert, you can slap so many on that you can't even see what you're doing anymore. You're so good at it, you can do it. And now, just, now you're just theorizing and playing. So. Uh, we've married language here to action, you know, and, if, and you think, well, this is dumbed down. Let me assure you, most of it is so technical that it, it, that it uh, unless you get to an aficionado status, you couldn't understand it. All right, now, but one other thing is, uh, you know, there's a problem in the United States. I don't know how it works in England. Uh, m most of the kids who fail in school fail because the demands of language by about fourth grade through middle school begin to get too complex. You get that scientific sort of language, that stuff you saw in geology. Kids who are not ready for it are bored by it, they hate it, it's arcane. So, you know, for years we've had a theory, well, you know, look, the, the poor kids can't handle this algebra language and this science language, it's mad. but the rich kids can, and it's, it's tough language, and they come from these uneducated homes, and their parents don't speak educated stuff, so of course they don't understand it. Well, the capitalists know that's not true, because in fact what we've done in popular culture is we sell our kids PhD language all the time and have no problem having poor kids master it all. You don't believe me? Play Yu-Gi-Oh. Any, any Yu-Gi-Oh players? Anybody heard of Yu-Gi-Oh? Okay, uh, maybe you don't have kids. I mean that. Um, you get, there are 10,000 Yu-Gi-Oh cards, right? It's meant to bankrupt parents. And the, the ga it's, a, it's a card game you play face to face. It's video games, it's movies, it's books. And the thing about Yu-Gi-Oh is it's connected to a language that is way over the kid's head. I mean, I ripped this card off from a seven-year-old who had to explain it to me. And here's the card. Every, I want you to notice, every word on this card is a technical term. 
When this card is normal summoned, flip summoned, or special summoned, successfully select and activate one of the following effects. Select one equipped, equipped spell card and destroy it. Select one equipped, equipped spell card and equip it to this card. You think that's, any, that's as bad as the geology. But kids who are seven, whether they're rich or poor, master this just fine. Right? How do they do it? Yu-Gi-Oh is what I call lucidly functional language. Every piece of that land, by the way, when the kids, are, you know, we got 10,000 cards, you play 40 of them at a time. When you argue over the rules, here's what you do. You go to a website that gives the rules. It's written in a super PhD language. I can't understand a word of it. I mean, I'd much rather do the linguistics I did as a, as a graduate student. Uh, so imagine your seven-year-old is forced to go to the internet and read stuff that's college level when his school's giving him a decodable text. So it, but here's how Yu-Gi-Oh does it. Every piece of that arcane specialist language is married to a physical action in the game. It is a recipe for what you do in the game. It's a recipe for how you lay the cards out, which are visual. It's also, by the way, completely explicated in the movies, because the movies are just the narrative of playing the game and acting it out. So think about it. Every, every word, every technical phrase is married to an action, to a rule in the game, to something I do, and to what I'm going to argue over with you. Right? It's lucidly functional because we have married language and action completely. By the way, that's exactly how physicists look at their language. They know the rules of physics, and they know each piece of it is married to stuff you do in this order, in this way, in the realm of action and in the realm of argument. Now, you know, capitalists discovered this. Right? Think about it. While we're, you know, debate go, we're making both in England and the United States back to basics, everybody's doing skill and drill, you know, the stuff's too hard except for the rich kids to do this stuff. They, we're out selling. This, by the way, is only one of hundreds. So your kid might play this in Dragon Ball Z and about Pokemon and a thousand others. All right. Another thing that gaming does, which of course is, a, is, is, is central to learning in the curriculum, is gaming has at its higher end what people, the modding culture. That is, more and more kids don't want the game as you gave it to them. They want to redesign it themselves. And games come often with the software of which they're made so that you can make it better. And the kid, the kid often thinks, you know, oh, yeah, I can do this better. And so don't take Tony Hawk, a skateboarding game. You can play it, or you can build the whole thing. You build your skate park, your skates, your tricks. You build the whole thing using a 3D engine that the, of the sort only professionals used to use. Then you give it to other kids, get a critique, and you are now designing a game. Uh, here is the Age of Mythology. This is a game in which you put whole mythological civilizations against each other. You can, you can do it. You can play it. You can also make it. You can mod the civilization, put every character, every environment. This is a piece of the 3D engine. This is one thing. Matt, how, do you how well do you think this is to a kid? By the way, this is the game seven-year-olds play as well. Age mythology, which you look at, you know, Egyptian mythology, Norse mythology, uh, Roman mythology, and you've got all these cultural variables, you've got all the environment, all stuff, and you say to the kid, in addition to playing this game, you build the whole thing. You build civilization. You make it up. And of course, or you can go write fan fiction about it. You can do anything you want. This is meta thinking with a vengeance. You think how well you understand the technology and the language connected to this game by the time you both played it and built it. See, you're, you're designing yourself. Uh, another example, even better, civilization. You run your own civilization for thousands of years against five or six other ones. In every posse, you have to you know, do the economy, military, diplomacy, the whole thing. You can also mod this game, build your whole civilization. At the University of Wisconsin, when I was there, uh, Kurt Squire had middle school African-American kids modding this game, not playing it, and they decided to build from the ground up Icelandic civilization. They built it from its most primitive days into the nuclear age. Every aspect of Icelandic civilization they built into this game. See, that's, that's now compare with that to what they were doing in school. They were, of course, in the bottom track. By the way, this is a game so complicated, most adults can't play it. All right, or this is The Sims, the best-selling game in history, but this is how you make a movie with The Sims, machinima, how you design it, light it, direct it, uh, do graphic design around it to make your own, because you know, you, 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 don't, you don't want to play it. So, by the way, modding, modding is a form of model-based thinking. See, the term that educators use model-based thinking means the best way to learn something is build a model that captures it. You want to learn physics? 
build some models that capture force and motion, or go play Portal and you can and, and mod Portal. Then you actually have to mod a world that actually fits the physical principles. So modding and model-based thinking are very similar. And here's where you get the just great metacognitive gains. Uh, we, can, can kids mod their curriculum in school? Did you give them the design engine by which you made the curriculum? All right, I want to finish with this. And I, I don't want, I've learned uh, in, I, in the few times I've been a, in England to try not to be contentious because you got British academics, you know, are, uh, they really go after red meat. So, um, <laughs> and I've been eaten a number of times. So, uh, the, but I, I, I don't think we live in a karaoke culture. Uh, I do think that what we have is a very interesting thing going on, and that is nobody in the 21st century in a developed country can succeed. Certainly they can't succeed by being good in school, not with our skill and drill schools. That'll get you a job at Walmart. I don't know if you have Walmart. Hopefully you don't. Um, yeah, but you know, the ar just like in the last talk, the argument is made that to be successful today in the 21st century, you have to have grit. Now what grit means is passion plus persistence. And the reason you have to have grit is you're not going to master anything at a high level unless you've put in thousands of hours of practice. And nobody's put in thousands of hours of practice unless they have passion. And in the developed world, just having a standard skill, being able to do what other people do is worthless because you can do it all over the world now. This thing with technology, you can do it everywhere. So the key for the future for developed countries, England, United States, or any other place, is how do we give kids grit? And the first thing is how do we get them to find a passion? I actually believe, by the way, if you have a, no matter what you have a passion for and you put 10,000 hours in, it, it'll pay off. Could be avocado carving, doesn't matter, whatever it is. All right, now I, so I want to close with this. Um, uh, you know, I want to tell you a story about passion. And I think this is a 21st century story. I think this is where the digital media has got positive possibilities. Um, and uh, and where, where we can really see a, a new way to think about schools as social organizations. So this is what I call, because I do think this thing of how, how do we get passion is not a question we've asked much. And people making you know, educational stuff with technology, you guys, if you can't give people passion and you're just giving them skill and drill, you're doing no better than we do with books in school. It isn't going to be any better because you put it on a nice screen. So how in hell do we give people passion? And by the way, it's not just for little kids because everybody's got to get a passion and learn now. So this is what I call my purple potty theory of passion. So this is a story of a woman who's in her 60s and she, was, uh, she w retired from being a postmaster general because she was too sick. She was a shut-in. She couldn't leave her home. Um, and in, you know, prior to digital media, end of story. However, her little granddaughters played The Sims. And The Sims is a community family simulator where you build stuff. The interesting thing about the game is that you have to actually design a lot of stuff in the game yourself. It's typically you design and play. And one of her little uh, granddaughters came up to her because she played, the older woman was playing The Sims as well, and said to her, you know, it really pisses me off in this game that you can't have, the girl's six, uh, you can't have uh, a purple potty. You know, the, the stuff you go to buy or get for the game that they've already made, that these damn designers made, you can't get a purple potty. And um, so the grandmother says, okay, uh, you know, like any, I'll go make one for you. She has no idea how to do it. it, it you, and it turns out to go make one, you've got to master Adobe Photoshop, you've got to master 3D images, you've got to do the hue, the texture, you've got to take it apart, you've got to do the coloring stuff. Wow, that's, it's way, way over her head. However, she finds, and there's a, there's a number of them, she finds a community, and a type of community that I call an affinity group or an affinity space that is out there on the web. I'm going to tell you in a minute what the features of those communities are, and they have the tools. They've, they've got ways to mentor you in Adobe Photoshop and 3D images. They've got the tools, and they tell this old woman, hey, we can help you make a purple potty for that kid. And, uh, uh, but you know, you gotta put in some hours. You gotta, you know, it, but she's, pa she's got passion because she wants to do it for her kid, for her granddaughter. And she goes in that community, she masters these things solely to make this purple potty, to make her kid happy. But then something else happens. It turns out that this community is organized in such a way that she comes to love the community and its tools and its passion, which is not for purple potties, but for 3D graphic design in this game. And she goes on to put in her 10,000 hours. 
and to learn not to design and color things, but to, and not just to color things or not just to make purple bodies, to become one of the top designers in Will Wright's game, because this, her stuff then gets put into the game, and Will Wright doesn't have to pay her. This is a great model, right? She has 13 million customers. 13 million. Her guest book, where you can say thank you because I like what you do, has one million people have thanked her. One million people have thanked her. I, Fourteen people have thanked me in my career, right? <laughs> She's a rock star at what she does. And by the way, it's not that, it, you, you know, in this community, they're well aware that everybody's not as, they're well aware that she's a star and, and other people aren't. But their attitude is you too could be a star if you want to put in your 10,000 hours with your passion. What's interesting about this, it's a culture of equal access, not equal outcomes. They have very high standards. But here's another interesting thing about their standards. Their standard is, and she says this in her writing, but in this community, nobody is ever expert enough where they don't need to learn something else and don't need somebody else to mentor them. The day, you never have the attitude that you ever know enough not to get mentored, uh, and you always also mentor other people. So she doesn't view her expertise as an individual thing. It's something tied to that community. Now, these, these websites or internet things that have these properties, and many don't. See, people don't flame each other on these sites. They do in others. They're ones where they flame in extremely interesting ways. They don't do it here. And this site, and by the way, I could tell you a story about a 12-year-old girl doing the same thing. Right? This is an, it, for, so what, what, what do these sites have? Because to me, th these affinity spaces, this is 21st century learning with a vengeance. It's the social organization of modern learning. They're organized around a passion. Sure, there, there is lots of socialization, and they're there to socialize, but the socialization is always subordinate to the passion. Uh, people on them produce and don't just consume. They have smart tools. All of these pieces of software there with good systems of mentorship. They are not age graded. There are 12 year olds to 70 year olds on there. Newbies and experts are together and, and nobody's flaming the newbie. You can, if you're a newbie, you can go lurk on the PhD site if you want. Everybody's there together. There is, a, there is a virtual kind of rule that everybody should mentor other people and get mentored. No matter how expert you are, somebody's there to mentor you. There's something more you need to know, and it's your job to mentor other people. Knowledge is distributed. That is, Tabby Lou does, it, does not feel all of her expertise is in her head. She knows some of it is in the other people in the community she can ask and in the community's tools and very much in the organization of the community around its passion. It's not her individual possession alone. She's not an aficionado in the sense in which it's all about her. Knowledge is dispersed in the sense that the site is linked to many others. Anything you can't get there, there's an immediate way to travel some other place and get it. Uh, they have a very interesting attitude towards learning, and they talk about this. Learning is your responsibility. It's an individual responsibility, but that never should preclude you collaborating and asking for help. Interesting, there's no contradiction. They expect you to have a proactive, individual attitude towards learning that still sees collaboration and asking for help as an essential part of learning. Uh, and as I've said, everyone is always still a learner in this site. So these are, now, uh, how many of these 10 features are in school? Uh, close to zero. So we sit, the, the problem, many, uh, you know, many of our problems about learning have already been solved so people who make Yu-Gi-Oh cards or sell the Sims can make money. And I don't begrudge them that. They, they are using the very principles we discovered, and nobody is discovering that poor kids or minority kids can't do Yu-Gi-Oh. Right? It's, see, think about it. Class differences, racial differences, happen only when you move this stuff to school. They don't happen in the 21st century curriculum out of school. Surely we can do better in school. But for, for those of you, and you guys are on the front lines, you're going to make this stuff, and you have a fundamental choice. You can give people situated meanings with all that I've said, and you can then assure everybody succeeds because you can't fail when you have a situated meaning. You can't fail to understand the game manual if you played the game. You can't fail to understand it, so you can't sort people anymore. Or you can do uh, the same thing we did with books and ruin another technology. Thank you. <laughs> Made up.
Yeah, we've got to I'm just going to take a couple of questions and then break for lunch because I think there was questions, a superb questions, comments, uh, diatribes. Yeah, anyone wants to uh, to take the mantle? Let's uh, a question from the back, perhaps. Can you see We're not getting some people. No questions. There's a hand. Lady there, just in this in the centre. Hello. If you could announce yourself and uh, who you are, where you're from, and then the question. Um, hello, my name is uh, Maja Mermin. I'm from Denmark, from the University of Copenhagen, doing a PhD in science didactics. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you want to take this video uh, game and put it into the formal education. Don't you have a problem since, um, I mean, since in formal education everything is arranged into hours and lectures and certain topics. Right. Whereas there's a lot of freedom when you have to. Um, right. If you're yeah, right. trying uh, to see that's that's the question that, that that always gets asked. It's a crucial question. Now that we know how this technology works for learning, can we just bring it to school, or do we have to destroy school as we know it? And there's big controversy here. If there are people who say, oh, uh, you know, we can bring it to school and it'll infect school, and we don't have to change it. Uh, I personally believe we have to break the mold of schooling to bring this stuff there. It does not fit. With, but see, look, let me just give one example. Uh, everything we know about the human brain says you do not learn things if you don't choose to learn. Right? If you don't choose it, you don't learn. You can't. That's just the way you're built. Then we have a whole system that says it doesn't matter. We're going to do it anyway. And then it, does, and then it keeps all of us in business to come and complain about it. So th the fact of the matter is this thing, you know, if you're in the serious game industry, please don't make trivial pursuit games or skill and drill games to keep this beast alive any longer. Uh, make games that break the paradigm, uh, and the pa then the paradigm will change. Right? You can do it. Okay, that's my question. Okay, we're going to break for lunch. Thank you very Thanks. much.